Will Jesus raise the cremated? The question of whether Jesus will raise those who have been cremated at his second coming is a common one among Christians. To address this, we must first acknowledge that the Bible does not give explicit instructions or commands regarding cremation. However, we can find some guidance through biblical principles and a broader understanding of God's power and promises. You return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Genesis chapter 3, verse 19. This verse indicates that our physical bodies came from dust and will return to dust after death, whether through natural decomposition or cremation. The focus is not on preserving our physical bodies, but on the fact that we will return to dust. Throughout history, bodies have decayed naturally, turning back into dust, which is essentially the same end state as cremation. When Jesus returns, he will perform the miracle of resurrection, transforming countless bodies, no matter their state. This includes those who have been cremated. God's power is not limited by the condition of our physical remains. He created the universe and has the power to raise the dead, regardless of whether their bodies were buried or cremated. Historically, cremation was practiced in biblical times, but it was not the norm among Israelites or New Testament believers. Burial was more common, with bodies laid to rest in tombs, caves, or the ground, as was the case with Jesus. However, the Bible does not command burial as the only method of handling a body after death. Some Christians believe that cremation might hinder resurrection. They refer to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 35 through 55. It is the same way with the resurrection of the dead. Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but they will be raised to live forever. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. They are buried in weakness, but they will be raised in strength. They are buried as natural human bodies, but they will be raised as spiritual bodies. For just as there are natural bodies, there are also spiritual bodies. This passage emphasizes that our earthly bodies, whether buried or cremated, will be transformed into glorious spiritual bodies at the resurrection. The state of the physical body at death does not limit God's ability to resurrect it. Those who died thousands of years ago are now more than dust, similar to cremation, yet they too will be resurrected. So, Christians shouldn't worry too much about cremation when it comes to resurrection. What's really important is believing in Jesus Christ and looking forward to eternal life because of His power to bring people back to life. The belief in God's all-powerful nature means that nothing, not even being turned into ashes, can stop His promise of eternal life and bringing people back to life if they believe. This idea helps people feel at ease and takes away any fear of cremation regarding what happens after we die. The choice between cremation and burial falls within Christian freedom. It's a personal decision that should be made with the support of loved ones. The Bible assures us that God's power extends beyond the physical condition of our remains, promising a resurrection for all believers. Can you still go to heaven if you were cremated? Another one of the most frequently asked questions today is whether someone can still go to heaven if they were cremated. This concern arises because the majority of people who die in America are now cremated rather than buried. Some pagan nations throughout history have practiced cremation, raising concerns that cremation might interfere with God's plan for bodily resurrection and deny a cremated person eternal life in God's new heaven and new earth. However, if someone belongs to Jesus Christ and is cremated, this act will not prevent their resurrection for several reasons. Firstly, Many people have suffered experiences equivalent to cremation as victims. It would be unjust to punish victims for circumstances beyond their control. Secondly, some regions have such scarce land that generations of burial are impractical. Japan is an example where land for burial is limited. Thirdly, many people are cremated without their choice, as someone else made the decision after they died. It would be unfair to hold someone responsible for a decision they did not make. Fourthly, the Bible does not specifically state that cremation is a sin like it does for other sins, such as murder, stealing, or lying. Some argue that since pagans in the Bible practice cremation, it is sinful. References include 1 Samuel chapter 31, verses 11-13. through 13. When the inhabitants of Jabesh 
Gilead, heard what the Philistines had done to Saul. All the valiant men got up and traveled all night and took the bodies of Saul and his sons from the wall of Beth Shan, and they came to Jabesh and burned them there. Then they took their bones and buried them under the Tamarisk tree of Jabesh and fasted for seven days. It is notable that even in this instance, the act of cremation was not condemned, but rather it was the care and respect for the leaders and the subsequent memorial that was emphasized. This suggests that what matters most is the reverence and dignity with which we treat the dead, rather than the method of body disposal. Ultimately, it is not the physical condition of our remains, but the condition of our soul that determines our eligibility for heaven. Amos chapter 2 verse 1. Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Moab and for four, multiplied delinquencies, I shall not reverse its punishment or revoke my word concerning it, because he burned the bones of the king of Edom to lime. In this instance, the judgment was upon disrespect shown to the enemy's remains, emphasizing the importance of dignity in death, not the act of burning itself. Thus, the focus should remain not on the method of our earthly remains' disposal, but on living a life that is pleasing to God, preparing our souls for the eternal life to come. As Christians, we must remember that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit and treat them with respect. Yet it is the condition of our hearts and the deeds of our lives that truly define our relationship with God. Amos chapter 6, verses 8-10 through 10. The Lord God has sworn an oath by Himself. The Lord, God of hosts, says, I loathe and reject the false pride of Jacob, Israel, and I hate his idolatrous palaces and citadels. Therefore, I shall hand over the city, Samaria, and everything that is in it. Even if cremation is considered a sin, Jesus died for all sins, and his sacrifice covers cremation. Moreover, a buried body eventually decomposes to a state similar to cremation. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 7 says, Then the dust out of which God made man's body will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. God made the first human body from the dust of the earth. Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 says, Then the Lord God formed, that is, created the body of, man from the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being, an individual complete in body, and spirit. The same God promises to remake resurrection bodies from the dust. Daniel chapter 12 verse 2 says, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, resurrect, these to everlasting life, but some to disgrace and everlasting contempt, abhorrence. This assurance means that those who have been cremated will still receive their resurrection bodies. Just as God formed the first human from the dust of the earth, He has the power to bring forth resurrection bodies from any state, including cremated remains. This process is not hindered by cremation. Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 through 21. But we are different because our citizenship is in heaven, and from there we eagerly await the coming of the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by exerting that power which enables Him even to subject everything to Himself, will not only transform but completely refashion our earthly bodies so that they will be like His glorious resurrected body. This change shows the endless power and detailed attention of God. It sends a strong message of hope and new beginnings that goes beyond the physical world or situations. No matter if our bodies go back to the earth or are changed by fire, the hope for resurrection stays the same. This keeps alive the belief in a life after this one, a life where our physical limits don't control us. In this future, we're promised the temporary nature of our bodies now is exchanged for a never-ending, perfect state without pain, sadness, or breaking down. This highlights how deep divine love is and gives us solid hope for eventual healing and renewal. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 42-44 through 44. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. The human body that is sown is perishable and mortal. It is raised imperishable and immortal. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in strength. It is sown a natural body, mortal, suited to earth. It is raised a spiritual body, immortal, suited to heaven. As surely as there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. 
This means that no matter the state of the body at death, whether buried, decomposed, or cremated, God will transform it into a glorified resurrection body. The act of cremation does not limit God's ability to fulfill His promises. For those who trust in Jesus Christ, the hope of resurrection is secure. Their faith ensures that they will be part of God's eternal plan, irrespective of how their earthly body is treated after death. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 17. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a shout of command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the blast of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain on the earth will simultaneously be caught up, raptured together with them, the resurrected ones, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be death. There will no longer be sorrow and anguish or crying or pain, for the former order of things has passed away. The Bible's message is clear. Faith in Jesus Christ is the determining factor for eternal life with God, not the method of handling a deceased body. Romans chapter 10 verses 9 through 10 says, Because if you acknowledge and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, recognizing his power, authority, and majesty as God, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes in Christ as Savior, resulting in his justification, that is, being made righteous, being freed of the guilt of sin and made acceptable to God. And with the mouth he acknowledges and confesses his faith openly, resulting in and confirming his salvation. Therefore, whether someone is buried or cremated, what matters is their relationship with Jesus Christ. The promise of resurrection and eternal life is assured for all who belong to Him. Within our faith, there is a significant amount of questions regarding what happens after death. Death is frequently accompanied by heartbreaking questions like, Why me? Why now? Why this? Why must we die? The Bible says it is appointed unto men once to die. Hebrews 9, 27, NKJV And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. For a time, we can avoid death. We can argue, plead and bargain. But the one constant enemy is death. I don't want to think about it will not make the reality go away. Death eventually intrudes into our carefully planned lives and completely changes things. We want to put an end to death. We cover our awkwardness around the topic by speaking of the deceased as if they did not die. He departed this life, we say. He passed away, or he's gone up yonder. The fact that the body is now in the ground and the deceased soul has passed is more than we would like to admit. We are told how to look younger, stay trim, and make more friends. All of these are admirable goals, but they include that we are desperately clinging to the present world. The truth is that life is fleeting. James 4, 14, New King James Version Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapour that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. The psalmist said, Each man's life is but a breath. Psalm 39, 5 Psalm 39, 5 NKJV Indeed, you may have made my days as handbreadths, and my age is as nothing before you. Certainly, every man at his best state is but vapour, Silah. If we want to make the most of our lives, we must accept that they will come to an end. Only those who are prepared to die are truly prepared to live. Facing Reality If we are fighting this enemy called death, we should learn about it so that we can deal with the dying process. We must understand how to confront the enemy on our own behalf, as well as how to deal with the unavoidable deaths of loved ones and friends. 
Can you imagine any military strategist saying, well, if there's an enemy out there, maybe I should find out something about him later? Adolescents are notorious for denying the reality of death. They take life for granted in their youth. But we all do when times are good, when there is plenty, when the economy is strong, and when things are looking up. When we all have full stomachs, the last thing on our minds is death. What exactly am I? What am I doing here? What am I going to do from here? Can we afford to ignore our ultimate adversary's warnings? With a biblically sound, realistic approach, we must break the conspiracy of silence on the subject. Death never takes a vacation. Death will forever be an unknown phantom, stalking helpless human victims outside of the Bible. Although death is, as the Apostle Paul claimed, the final enemy, one of the main goals of this video is to demonstrate that it does not have to be feared. Death, our mortal enemy. The Bible emphasizes that death is an enemy, not a friend, to both God and us. Death, enemy of God's plan. But, Lord, I don't want to die. And the Lord, as it were, answers, I didn't plan the world that way, but someday even this enemy will be destroyed. God reminds us of that through the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians 15, 25-26 NKJV For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Why is death God's adversary? Because, in contrast to God, the creator and author of life, it destroys life. In fact, the Bible tells us that sin, pain, disease and death were not originally part of God's plan for man. Death was the penalty for sin, and Adam and Eve chose it based on their free will. He warned the first man and woman that if they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would perish. But Satan laughed at God's warning and assured them that they would not perish. Adam and Eve chose to ignore God's warning and fall for Satan's deception. Romans 6, 23, NKJV For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Death is the fate of all humans and all other living things, both plants and animals. According to the Bible, sin and death have afflicted all of God's creation, including the natural world, and sin will be eradicated and creation restored to God's original plan only when Christ returns in glory at the end of the current era. Have you ever wondered what would have happened if man had not sinned? We have no idea, because the scriptures do not tell us. There will be a generation of believers who will now know physical death. Those who are still alive when Jesus Christ returns in glory, for his own will not die, but will be changed in the blink of an eye. 1 Corinthians 15, 52 NKJV In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. What right have you to enter heaven? Every man and woman who has ever lived must respond to that question. What makes some people think they have a free ticket to heaven? They provide numerous responses, but the majority of them can be classified into three basic attitudes. Just look at what I've done on earth, says the first. My record is pretty good compared to some. I'll be in heaven because I lived such a good life. That person is in trouble. The Bible says, For all have sinned 
and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23, NKJV So, if we rate our good deeds on a scale of 1 to 10, even a perfect 10 would fall short. No one can ever live a life that is good enough, the Bible says. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. James 2, 10, NKJV The second answer may be, I really don't know, and I'm not sure that I care. I gave it some thought for a while, but there were so many other things that seemed more important. Excuses will get you nowhere. The Bible says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Romans 1, 20, NKJV Only one response will grant a person the distinct privilege, the joy of entering heaven because I have accepted Jesus Christ as my Saviour and believe in him. He is the one who sits at God's right hand, interceding for me. Nobody can deny that Christian's admission to heaven. Christ Jesus, who died and was raised from the dead, is now at God's right hand, interceding for us. Romans 8, 33-34, King James Version who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. What a brilliant idea! Jesus is our advocate, our lawyer, pleading our case before God the Father, telling him that the person being presented for admission to heaven must be admitted solely through God's grace, not through any good works or noble deeds performed on earth. 